Hello, my name is Alice Bradbury. I'm from the UCL Institute of Education and I'm working the Research Centre at the Helen Hamlin Centre for Pedagogy. This talk is all about how, from my research, I found that datification happens in primary schools and in early years. And particularly, I'm thinking about how datification is has an impact on children and on teachers and also what drives datification. So where is it coming from and how can we try to begin to understand this process, which is so complicated? So I'm going to talk about the five P's of datification. And this is just a way that I've started to use of thinking about how datification works in real life, in real everyday situations and trying to kind of split up some of the different ways in which it operates, the different impacts that it has and the different drivers that there are in terms of why people are using data more, why people are more reliant on it and why it starts to have a greater impact on their everyday working lives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the drivers of datification, that is policy and private companies. But then I'm going to move on to talking about the five P's of datification, which are things that I see it having an impact on. So there are two P's, which are the drivers, policy and profit. And there are five P's, which are the impact. So first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, policy, which is one of my particular interests anyway. We have a great deal of policy in terms of assessment in primary and early years education in this country. We have the early years uh, foundation stage profile in reception. We have um, the key stage test, the SATs at six and seven and at um, in year six at age 10, 11. We have the phonics test in year one and we have uh, now the multiplication tables test in year four as well. So we have a lot of statutory assessment. And clearly one of the things that comes out of statutory assessment is data. So you produce the data for the assessment itself and you analyze that, but you also produce a lot of assessment data just through preparing for these tests. So you do mock tests, you think about who's on track, you think about who is um, going to need some support to get meet the benchmark for the uh, assessment. There's a lot of data produced and tracking data produced in preparation for these tests as well. So policy is there putting the tests in, but also makes a big difference in terms of everyday kind of month by month planning and tracking of assessment too. One area that I've been really interested in in the last few years is the attempt to bring in a new assessment in reception, the baseline assessment. It was brought in in 2015 and then abandoned in 2016, and now it's being reintroduced piloted and in 2019 and then brought back in um, it was supposed to be in 2020 but they've decided to put it off again for another year because of covid baseline assessment is an attempt to calculate a score on entry to school so it's an idea that you can assess the value added between the child's entry to school in reception and the uh, end results of their sats and so it's very much a data-driven assessment it's all about um, calculating value added rather than about helping the teacher understand the child, for example. And with my colleague Guy Roberts-Holmes, I've done quite a lot of work on baseline over the last few years. And one of the things that's interesting about it is how much it works in tandem with private companies. So when the uh, baseline assessment was brought in in 2015, three different private companies were used to deliver it. And they, of course, all then received all of the data and became part of that data machinery that schools were operating within. There's also, of course, other commercial software which helps schools with their um, data management, tracking systems, other companies that will come in and help you to analyse your data. Some schools have, um, as I will talk about later, a particular data manager, someone who has a role in simply calculating the data that they have and making it um, digestible for the teachers. So there is an interesting relationship, of course, between policy and the private as well, which we see datification um, operating within that, that space of kind of private sphere with public sector organisations. So we start with the first one, which is pedagogy. What I mean by the impact of datification on pedagogy is things where we see examples of teachers 
changing their what they're doing, their activities in order to collect the right data. So, for example, when we had baseline assessment, we found teachers who were setting up activities for the children and doing them specifically so that they could tick off a particular assessment task. So in that way, datafication is having an impact on pedagogy because the pedagogy is driven by the data needs. We also see um, things like teaching particular areas, particular bits of the curriculum in order to produce data or to improve the data. So, for example, we might see people doing extra phonics in preparation for the phonics test. We might see people um, using data that they've already collected and using that to determine what they end up teaching because they see that the children are particularly behind in one area. We also see things in terms of pedagogy like spending time collecting data in the classroom. So in early years, that might mean taking photos, um, writing down notes, doing videos, various ways of collecting um, evidence that children can do particular things and spending time doing that necessarily rather than teaching. So the second area, which obviously is related to pedagogy, is practice. But by this, I mean things not just in the classroom, but more widely. So there might be um, things like organising pupils into different groups based on the data. Um, things like educational triage, where you prioritise groups of children who you think are going to uh, borderline children, who you think are going to pass the test or do really um, well on the assessment if you give them some extra help. And you use the data to um, work out who those children are and then you prioritise them. So grouping systems that are based on data are one of the practices that might arise from datafication. There's things like teachers spending a lot of time inputting data out of class, after school, in their weekends and holidays, putting in data, analysing data and finding stories to tell about it. There's also examples of things like interventions when you don't have the right data in some way. So you've got um, children who are not achieving highly enough on one particular area. So you put in a particular intervention, you draw the children out. And so these kind of practices are all very much tied up with the data you're producing in the school. OK, so the third area is priorities. And you can tell from the things I've already said about pedagogy and about practice that teachers' priorities change in relation to data. So you might get examples of priorities shifting, things like adjusting the curriculum and adjusting the um, topic of the week, adjusting what you're doing in the focus of a particular lesson. You might adjust everything in order to get the right kind of data or to improve your data. You might also spend less time, for example, um, building relationships with children. And that's something we certainly found when we were looking at baseline assessment is that if you're drawing children out one to one, you're spending a lot more time um, assessing them, doing formal kind of tasks with them rather than just sitting and having a chat about what they like at about school, about how they're settling in. And one of the things that teachers told us again and again was that they felt that there was less time for children to build relationships with the adults in their class if they were having to collect a lot of data on the children. A further priority that might change is how teachers spend their time. So do they spend their time planning, preparing resources, or do they spend their time analysing data, uh, processing it, putting it, inputting it into the computer and uploading it? There's a lot of different priorities to be in a teacher's life. And one of the things we found is that the use of data has shifted what those priorities are and what they feel their demands are on their time have changed in that they're spending a lot more time focused on activities related to data. So the fourth area that I'm going to talk about is people. So what I mean by that is thinking about different subjectivities that are created through datafication. So using data every day and using it in the classroom and using it to affect your daily practice, if you're a teacher, has an effect on who you feel you are as a person and who you are as a professional. So we, one of the things we found in our research was that teachers felt much more like they were data collectors, that they were assessors, 
they weren't spending all of their time focused on the child, but they were spending time focused on producing the right numbers. The children, in turn, also had a different role. They become a different a data point. They become a source for data and a source for numbers or signs of progress. And some people call that a data double, um, the idea that the data, the child gets reduced to data. The school leaders then have a different role again because they are there monitoring the data. They're being the ones doing the surveillance over the data. And all of this sort of changes who people feel they are within the educational, the schooling process. This also changes what we see as successful. So the successful teacher becomes one who's producing the right data, who's producing the right um, measures of progress, for example. And all of that becomes defined by those numbers, the algorithms, the um, equations you've got set up in your spreadsheet. So not only are the people being changed, but also perhaps how we define people as successful or as unsuccessful are also being changed within this datification process. So the final element of thinking about people is to think about the new roles that are created when we have processes of datification. So there suddenly becomes new actors and new um, powerful actors within the system. You get some private companies who become um, controllers of the data, providers of the service, often come in and help schools to manage their data and to make them make sense of it. You also get professional data analysts and different companies who come and again, offer to help schools with their data and make it manageable. So they become new roles and new players within the educational system. So the final P I'm going to talk about is power. Data obviously makes education governable and there is great power in that. So the government decides what is a successful school and they use the data to work that out through the processes of accountability. There's also increased visibility for professionals. A teacher is made visible through their data and they're also subject to control through it, as I said, through being encouraged to change their pedagogical practices due to what the data tells them. There's also power located in new places, the new actors I talked about, like the data analyst who becomes the key interpreter of what's going on. Um, they translate it back to parents, back to teachers and governors. There's also the private companies who have power because they control large data sets and they begin to define um, how children should be assessed, for example. And there's also great power, of course, in this seemingly neutral thing of the algorithm. The algorithm that decides who passes or fails, who is making good progress. There is a great power in the designer of that algorithm, which, of course, we never really see when we're in school. It's all something defined outside, beyond the school gates. And but there is great power, therefore, located in those kind of decisions that mean data shows us one thing or shows us another thing. So the five areas I've talked about today are all places where I see datification as having an impact. I've also mentioned the two driving forces behind datification, that is policy and also the private companies, which I see as the things that are the underlying kind of causes of datification. Obviously, all of these things vary in different schools, in different places and different contexts. So what I hope this framing does is to encourage thinking about datification, which bears in mind that maybe the less obvious impacts not the stuff that we can see when we walk into a classroom, but also the more subtle things about how it changes who we are and the power relationships and so on. And encourage that kind of critical thinking about who we become in this kind of data obsessed education system. And of course, how data relates to power. One thing I haven't mentioned, which I think would be important perhaps to say at this point, is that there is a final P which we are all thinking about, which is the pandemic. Obviously, we've seen a huge increase in the use of uh, digital means of education because the schools have been closed and we're not really in a position yet to understand what those impacts are going to be in the long term of that shift towards the digital and how much we're going to need it over the next few years. I think there's an interesting phenomenon there in the use of more digital platforms to monitor children and to monitor parents. Um, it's another area I think that we will have to explore in the next few years because obviously there is new data being produced, for example, in terms of how often you use the, the homeschool platforms and how much you're engaging with them as well. There is some evidence that 
different kinds of communication are actually quite helpful for parents. That some parents find it easier to send information back and forth via digital means than they do to talk to the teacher, for example. For some groups of parents, that's a much easier way. And I think there's some interesting developments probably to come in the next few years in terms of talking about home and school communication in terms of digital um, platforms. Overall, though, I think a lot of the debate about the pandemic, certainly in the UK, has been about learning loss, some kind of calculable data based ca learning loss, which is a really questionable idea and actually shows us how data obsessed we are, that everyone wants to measure exactly how much learning children have lost over those few months. I think that we can see to finish up is an indication of how important numbers and data have become within the education system.